Pessimism is seductive because it can be so precise and articulate, while optimism is often an exercise in uncertainty. Morgan Housel. So I'm recording this podcast pretty late at night, and I apologize if you can hear that in my voice. The reason that I'm recording this so late is actually because I've been procrastinating. And the reason I've been procrastinating is because for the past week or so, I've done very little else besides coding with LLMs. Now, one of the ways that I have stayed ahead of the competition in my poker career is by creating my own software. And that's either for research for me or for training for my students. But the problem is that I actually can't code. I have very limited coding knowledge. But now with Claude 3.5 Sonnet, which is what I've been using, and there are a lot of other models that can be used as well, um, pretty much anybody can code. And I've been developing this new trainer for my students at Mobius Cash. And it's been a bit of a frustrating process. There's still a lot of kinks that need to be worked out, obviously. But man, it just feels like magic when it works. And I just feel so liberated and excited because now I finally can code and I don't have to hire other people to code for me and I can tinker with every little detail. Um, If there's one thing I'm sure of, it is that the world has changed in an irreversible way and the future is going to be very, very strange. Hopefully in a way that is just awesome. But there will also be some negative consequences too and that's what this episode is sort of going to be about. I want to talk about AI and what I think the impact on online poker will be. And I want to be careful not to project too far out, like really beyond five years, I think it's anybody's guess. But I do want to offer my opinion on what I think the short term will look like. Now, before I get into that, I want to share a tweet that caught my attention in the last week. This tweet was by Chamath Palihapitiya, who is a billionaire venture capitalist, entrepreneur, and a founder of Social Capital, which is a private equity firm. He's also a co-host of the All In podcast, which is probably one of the podcasts that I do listen to the most. I think they have a lot of interesting takes on economics, politics, and social issues. And it's called the All In podcast because Chamath and the other guys who run the podcast all happen to be recreational poker players as well. And Chamath wrote a tweet recently about the impact of AI on society. And I'm going to read that tweet now. And when you listen to this, I'd like you to think about the quote that I opened with, which talks about how easy it is to predict very specific pessimistic futures, but it can be a lot harder to be specific about optimistic futures. I'll also link this tweet in the show notes. And just for fun, to stay on the theme of this episode, I'm actually going to use Chamath's voice to read his tweet. And this is very easy to do. It took me about 30 seconds to do with a site called 11 Labs. But this is not Jamat's actual voice. This is a tweet. I just want to be clear of that. And hopefully this doesn't get taken down. So he says, Curious about AI's impact on society? Look at online poker as an interesting early window into the future. Why? Online poker is a multi-billion dollar economy and will be worth exactly zero dollars over the next few years. The fall of this economy will be a harbinger of what's possible as generalized AI advances are applied to the low-hanging fruit markets. Agents are becoming smart enough, reasoning, memory, chain of thought, that poker-playing agents will run over the human population in legal poker sites and will make money for their creators. But won't these bots be stopped? These aren't bots, they are agents, and will know how to lose certain hands, creating an illusion of normalcy. They will learn to shear the sheep versus skin the sheep. You can expect that online poker leaderboards will flip to names you've never heard of, and those names won't be real people, but groups of programmers making money. I suspect that most people stop playing online for money pretty quickly, and the economic value of this market implodes. Okay, great. (laughs) Well, it can't get too much more pessimistic than that, can it? So here's my analysis on what Jamat said. I actually responded to him on Twitter, and here's what I said. I said, this view is too pessimistic. Bots are a real issue, but poker solvers, machine learning, and AI have been around for years, 
yet major bot problems only plague unregulated sites that don't care. Your analysis overlooks the severe penalties for getting caught. Making money in poker requires capital and time to overcome variance. And if you're caught botting, all your funds are confiscated. And if a bot farm has any detectable fingerprint, the entire operation collapses like a house of cards. No pun intended. At high stakes, most online players know each other, so if an unknown account starts crushing, it's a major red flag. The combination of these factors makes the risk-to-reward ratio unfavorable in well-regulated environments. And surprisingly, Chamath actually responded to that, and he said, I'll play online and have a separate machine tape my screen in real time, process it, and give me GTO recommendations on a separate tablet. I'll then click on the right play. Every time. How will you catch me? Be specific. So this was kind of a weird response to get. And I think anybody who really knows a good amount about online poker, who plays online poker professionally, will think that this is an odd response. Here was what I told him. I said, I will ask you to record yourself playing from multiple angles for a few days and analyze your play style before and after. Poker Stars often requires this from pros. See the attached screenshot, which is an email from Poker Stars support. Anyone with an anomalous win rate or unusually accurate stats could be asked to do the same. In the future, some sites might even require pros to always have webcams on during play, but we're not there yet. Also, if you're just reading outputs from a screen, your timing will likely show it. You need to mimic human-like timing in your actions to avoid detection. The email that I attached to this tweet was a support email from PokerStars, which was sent to one of my students who they asked to do a review for. It was a frustrating situation for my student. He ended up having his account locked for about a month while they reviewed it, but he eventually got it back. And what he had to do was basically record about two to three hours of himself playing from multiple angles to make sure that he wasn't wearing an earpiece or getting input from any external source while he was playing or running any other software on his computer. He then sent that video into Stars. they analyzed it, and they confirmed that he was a legit player, and they gave him his account back. So Chamath obviously doesn't know that much about online poker because he doesn't seem to know that this is a fairly common practice already for catching people who are cheating in this way. And Chamath didn't respond to that. I, I was actually very surprised that he even responded to my first response but I want to go a little bit deeper into analyzing this here now. Let's take a quick break so I can tell you about my program, the Mobius GTO Stat Checker, which is now available for both MTTs and cash games. This program automatically compares your stats to solver data and pinpoints where you're off track, color coding your stats to show you where you're too passive or too aggressive compared to GTO. You can also use this program to analyze your opponent's tendencies and exploit their mistakes. For example, you can easily figure out how often your pool is bluffing on the river and therefore how often you should be bluff catching. Plus, it's great for evaluating the quality of your games. You can check the average win rate of the regulars in your pool or see how many hands in your database were played by recreational players. The Mobius GTO Stat Checker takes the guesswork out of your study routine so you can focus on fixing your leaks and exploiting the leaks of your opponents. This course includes video modules to walk you through how to use the program and a support channel to make sure that you never get stuck. You can click the link in the show notes to learn more about the stat checker and purchase a copy for MTTs or cash games today. So there are certain things that LLMs or large language models can do and they can do it better than humans. And not only can they do it better than humans, but you can't even tell that a human didn't generate the output. So one example of this is writing. These models can write just as well as humans. They actually can write a lot better than the average human. And not only that, but schools and universities are trying to ban the use of these tools, but they can't really enforce it because you just can't tell if a large language model generated some text or if a human did it. So writing text is an example of a complex task that a computer can do as well or better than a human and also can't be detected as non-human while it's doing it. 
Now, I would say a more difficult example of a task for an AI would be something like、uh, text to voice. So these models are already quite good at doing text to voice. I mean, as you just heard, that sounds a lot like Chamath, and I didn't really even spend that much time messing around with the settings. I didn't do any editing of the output that it gave me, but it sounds very good. And there's only like some small things that you can point out to identify that that is AI generated. And if I didn't tell you that it was AI generated before you listened to it, you probably wouldn't have even noticed. But There is still some quirks with it, and if you were to analyze、uh, this text-to-speech, you could probably be pretty accurate in detecting whether some speech was AI-generated or not. You know, you might find things like certain words being pronounced a bit weird, the cadence being too uniform. There's all sorts of ways that you could detect that. If we were to go to one of the most difficult things right now that these models are trying to accomplish. That would be something like text to video. Runway is an example of a text to video AI. You can play around with that too, but if you try to generate any sort of complex video with AI, it still is very obvious in 2024 that it is AI generated because there's just mistakes everywhere. Especially if you look at something that's really difficult for an AI to handle, like somebody's hand and the, all the movements of. The individual fingers on a hand, and my point with this is that in poker, if you're going to cheat and you're going to use a bot or an agent, there's going to be two challenges that you have to overcome. The first is the technical challenge of getting a bot to actually win in online games, and at this point, I'm fairly confident in saying that that's not too difficult to achieve for somebody who is a good programmer. What is hard, though, is doing that while Bypassing security on a site that actually has good security. So let's look at another example. Let's talk about self-driving cars for a second. Self-driving cars. I'm bringing this example up because I think it's the best example of an extremely complex human task that computers can now do. Probably the most complicated task that computers are doing, better than humans at this point. Self-driving cars are much safer. They just get into far less accidents than humans do already, and they're going to get even better. But imagine you wanted to create a self-driving car that made it impossible to detect that that car was not being driven by a human. In this case, safety or how well the car drives would not be your only priority. In fact, you would have to make the car drive a little bit less safely. If you wanted it to pass for a human driver, and if you think about it, there are tons of different ways where you could determine if a car was self-driving or if it was driven by a human. I mean, first of all, very obvious way you could just pull the car over and check to see if anybody was driving, right? You could also analyze. The car's overall driving style. You'd probably find in the case of a self-driving car that it drives really cautiously, more cautiously than most humans, I would say, except like little old grannies. And when you watch footage of these self-driving cars, you will often see people honking at them because they're going too slow or just not making moves quickly enough or whatever. You could also track the car for a while and analyze more complicated stuff like its acceleration and deceleration, and you might find that those patterns are far too uniform to be a human. That no human could step on the gas pedal or the brake so perfectly to accelerate or decelerate as smoothly as a self-driving car can. You could analyze the way it turns. You could analyze the way that it stops for certain objects in the street, in ways that might not be human, and on and on and on. There's many different ways that you could analyze this, and you can see how creating a self-driving car that drives exactly like a human is actually a much harder technical challenge than creating a self-driving car that drives almost perfectly. Now let's bring this back to poker. Poker is the same sort of deal. Where it's not just a major technical challenge to create a computer that can play and win at poker, but it is also a major challenge to avoid detection. 
So a poker site can easily do basic human verification. They can just do captchas or ask you to verify your, your identity and your presence in some way. They can also do more advanced methods like what they did with my student, where they have you record yourself playing, submit them video, and then analyze your play style before and after. But as you can probably imagine, poker sites have all of your data, so there's many ways that they can track your behavior and it, figure out if your behavior is non-human. One simple way they can do this is to just see if your bot ever glitches out. And that's one way that we have proven that there are bots on Ignition. I wrote a thread about this, and you can go back to the first episode of this podcast if you want to hear more about that. But basically, many people on Ignition have seen these bots that crash, and then there's no one operating them. So what happens sometimes is the bot will crash, but it will continue sitting at the table. It won't sit out. It'll just time down to the exact same amount of time every single hand and then fold preflop. And you end up seeing it play sometimes 100 plus hands preflop folding every single hand. If a human was playing, it would either sit out if it was not at the computer or disconnect if it lost its connection, but it would obviously never behave in that way. So if something like that happens and you're on a serious site with real security, um, (laughs) you're gonna get banned and they're going to confiscate the money in your account. So your bot can't glitch. Your bot also can't play too perfectly. It can't be balancing many different sizes in all of these complex scenarios in the way that a human would never be able to do. It can't be defending optimally in every single node. It can't play a perfect preflop strategy, and so on and so on. A poker bot also needs to mimic human timing. It can't be perfectly random in its timing, but it also can't be too consistent with its timing either because no human is. A human needs to take a longer time to think through a genius play before they make it. And in addition to timing, a bot also needs to interact with the poker site software in a human way. For example, their mouse movements need to match up with the way that humans typically use a mouse when they play poker on a computer. Furthermore, if you want to win a lot of money with a bot, you probably don't want that bot to just play a game theory optimal strategy. You want it to be able to exploit its opponents, especially the weakest opponents at the table, the casual players. So you want to have some sort of exploitative baseline built in which means that your bot is, by definition, going to be exploitable. If somebody detects what it's doing, they can play counter exploits against your bot and win a lot of money against it. So if you determine that your pool is under bluffing three bets and four bets preflop, and you start to program your bot so that it overfolds significantly versus three bets and four bets, well, somebody who is playing, especially with a HUD or something, is going to probably notice that and is going to start 3-betting and 4-betting your bot quite a lot. So your bot needs to probably hide its exploits to some extent. It can't go maximally exploitative. And then it also needs to be able to adapt when it encounters a player who it thinks is exploiting it. And that is also quite a difficult technical challenge to layer on top of all the challenges that we've already spoken about. And so when you think about all of the things that you have to do to run a profitable poker bot on a site that actually has security, you almost start to wonder why would somebody put this much effort into this when probably getting really good at poker would be less effort than it would be to program this type of bot. Again, considering that every time you fail and you do get detected by security, you lose all of the money that's in your account and you get banned and you have to find a new identity to play under and try again. And that is why I think we don't really see an issue of bots overrunning sites like PokerStars or GG Poker. Now, do I think there are some bots and cheaters? Absolutely. But it's not going to be a significant amount. And this is another great thing about poker, which is that even when you cheat in poker, as long as you can't see the other player's cards, or you're not colluding against them, 
um, if you're cheating by using some sort of RTA, your win rate still is not that massive. You don't have that great of an edge. And so if people are using RTA or your, your site has bots on it, there needs to be a lot of those players. They need to make up a substantial chunk of the pool to make the games become unbeatable. So I think poker is actually highly resilient in that sense. And by the way, we haven't really even talked about ways that poker sites could step up their security if they really needed to. Perhaps poker sites could require a webcam for professional players on online poker sites, or they could require you to scan your face or something like that before you start a session. I mean, there are a lot of apps that require this type of thing, particularly financial apps. But at least those apps have proven that these types of security checks can be commercially viable. The other thing that I have a little bit of an issue with is that these sort of doomsday predictions always seem to predict the future in a very lopsided way. By that, I mean they focus on how these technological advances will be exploited by bad actors, but they rarely consider how the good guys can use them as well. Like, why can't AI be used to help security on poker sites? Computers are extremely good at pattern recognition, so if you can feed them a bunch of data about, you know, this is what accounts that cheat in online poker look like, this is what their data and behavior look like, then why can't a computer use that information to find and ban other accounts that are actively cheating on poker sites? And then finally, I think this is only going to be a huge issue at low and mid stakes, because... High stakes online poker is such a small community that, like I said in my response to Chamath, if you are just an unknown who comes out of nowhere and starts crushing, people are going to be pretty suspicious of you, and you are going to be under the microscope, not just by the poker site security, but also by all of the top pros that you're playing against, which are far more scrutinizing than the poker sites actually but it's important to deal with this stuff at low and mid stakes as well, because if low and mid stakes get overrun by cheaters, then the pathway to high stakes is going to be broken and online poker is going to be in a pretty sad state if that happens. Frankly, I don't think that bots are a major issue right now on regulated sites that have solid security. By that, I mean primarily poker stars and GG poker, but also others too. And I just don't think that this is going to be a problem, at least in the near future. And the only reason that I am not looking out further into the long term is just because of how crazy the technological development has been over the past five years. It's pretty naive to be able to think that you can predict what is going to happen with technology in the world, even just five years from now, the way things are progressing at this point especially as a casual observer like myself. So in summary, I don't think this is Chamath's best take, not his best poker take, not his worst poker take either though. And <laughs> I don't want to dunk on Chamath too much in this podcast, but I just thought it would be fun to end with this Chamath quote, which I do think is his worst take. Chamath said on Lex Fridman's podcast, it's about 22 minutes in, he says, I think Phil Hellmuth, is the antidote to computers more than any other player playing today. And when you see him in a heads-up situation, he's played like basically call it 10 of the top 20 people so far, and he's beaten all but one of them. That's all I got for this one. Remember to stay optimistic. I'll catch you guys in the next one. Good luck at the tables.